softly amid the pine forests of northern Minnesota. This secluded setting is the birthplace of the mightiest river in North America. From Lake Itasca, Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi flows more than 2,000 miles through the heartland of the United States. This great river and its tributaries form the Mississippi River Basin, drawing water from 31 states and draining about 40% of the United States. It is a broad, moving ribbon that glides past an ever-changing panorama of scenic wonders, rich farmlands, busy cities, and picturesque towns. The Mississippi is a blessing to millions of Americans who live, work, and play along its banks and upon its wide waters. Throughout history, the Mississippi has been a necessary source of water for life and industry. It is a natural highway for moving people, supplies, and products. The earliest river travelers were American Indians, European explorers, and fur trappers who used canoes to carry supplies and trade items. Fort Armstrong, which was located at the tip of Arsenal Island, was a military outpost built to deter British and other foreign trading companies from operating in the River Valley. At that time, the most common mode of river transportation was the flatboat, or keelboat, with shallow hulls specifically designed to navigate the river. Flatboats were sturdy rafts meant to go one way, downstream. Keelboats could be poled upstream, which was difficult and backbreaking work. As the area was settled and the frontier expanded west, the Mississippi hosted the golden years of the steamboat. In the early 1800s, steamboats were essential to the settlement of the Mississippi River Valley. As miners, lumbermen, and settlers moved into the area, the need for supplies increased. Steamboats were the equivalent of today's moving vans, carrying furniture, plows, mail, food, livestock, and families. As the years passed, steamboats began to cater to businessmen and tourists who demanded a more comfortable traveling experience. However, in those days, river travel was often neither pleasurable nor safe. The river had a mind of its own, with dangerous rapids and numerous hidden snags and sandbars. Insufficient depths during periods of low water caused many mishaps. Safe river travel was almost impossible at the Rock Island Rapids and the Des Moines Rapids at Keokuk. The Rock Island Rapids ran from Rock Island, Illinois, upriver to LeClaire, Iowa. To get through the rapids safely, many steamboat captains turned the helm over to Rapids pilots hired to navigate this treacherous section of the Mississippi. Additional measures were taken to ensure safe passage through the rapids. Beginning in 1832, a young West Point graduate, Lieutenant Robert E. Lee, began the first Army Corps of Engineers survey of the rapids at Rock Island and Keokuk. In his report, he recommended deepening and straightening the main channel, widening it where necessary, and removing rock. It took more than 20 years for Congress to authorize these improvements. Meanwhile, as the population increased, the demand for passable waterways grew. In 1879, Congress authorized a four and a half foot channel project and a six foot channel project in 1907. These projects included the removal of snags such as trees and large rocks from the bottom of the river and construction of a series of wing dams, rock and wood structures, which jut out from the sides of the river to divert water towards the middle of the channel. Despite the Corps' channel improvement efforts, navigation slowed to a crawl on the upper river. Fearing the Midwest would become an economic backwater without a diverse transportation network, 
business and navigation interests sought a new system that could operate more economically in a deeper channel. Through the River and Harbors Act of 1930, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was authorized to construct a system of locks and dams from St. Paul, Minnesota to St. Louis, Missouri, making the Upper Mississippi navigable for modern commercial traffic. This project authorized a main channel with a minimum depth of 9 feet and a minimum width of 400 feet. A series of 29 locks and dams were constructed from above St. Paul to St. Louis. This system allows boats to negotiate a fall of 420 feet in about 670 miles of river, creating a stairway of water. Below St. Louis, on the lower Mississippi, locks and dams are not needed. The Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois rivers entering the Mississippi make the water deep enough to support navigation. The first lock and dam of the nine-foot channel project was built right here at Lock and Dam 15, as part of the New Deal program. The lock was completed before the dam, coming into service mid-August 1933. Construction was complex, requiring thousands of red-hot rivets, sandblasting the metal clean and applying tar as sealant and hundreds of gallons of paint. When construction was complete, a new era of transportation began as steamboats gave way to modern diesel-driven towboats. Powerful towboats can push up to 15 fully loaded barges on the upper Mississippi River. One barge contains the equivalent of 15 jumbo train hoppers or 58 fully loaded semi-trucks. A tow with 15 individual barge units is the same as 870 semi-trucks bumper to bumper or a train almost three miles long. Grain, coal, and petroleum products are the main cargo shipped on the Mississippi River. Other cargo includes sand, gravel, scrap metal, fertilizers, powdered cement, asphalt, and commercial chemicals. Towboats typically carry a crew of 11, consisting of two licensed pilots, one of which is the captain, a first mate, an engineer, six deckhands, and a cook. The typical crew works 28 days on, 28 days off. These tows need the lock and dam system to keep millions of tons of cargo moving up and down the Mississippi River. Barges draft nine feet when fully loaded, so more than nine feet of water is needed for river traffic to navigate the upper Mississippi. Because the natural river flow above St. Louis did not provide this depth, dams were needed to raise the water levels. The areas between these dams are referred to as navigation pools. Every major river that empties into the upper Mississippi is gauged to determine that tributary's amount of flow. Corps personnel use this data to determine how much water to release through the dam's gates, or how much to hold back to maintain appropriate pool depths. Because boats cannot navigate through the dam, all river traffic must go around the dam using the locks. Think of the lock as a giant water elevator that boats must use to get around the dam. Most locks along the Mississippi River, like the one here at Rock Island, Illinois, are 600 feet long and 110 feet wide. However, a few locks south of here are 1,200 feet long. Operation of the lock is a relatively simple process. When a vessel enters the lock heading downstream, the gates are closed behind the vessel and the water level is the same as the upper pool. A system of valves are opened and water is let out of the lock via a 12-foot square tunnel until the water level in the lock matches the water level of the lower pool. The downstream gate is then opened and the journey can continue. When a vessel enters a lock heading upstream, the procedure is reversed. Pumps are not necessary in the locking operation because water seeks its own level. This is the procedure when the vessel is small enough to be locked through all at once. However, when a 15 barge tow measuring 1,200 feet long enters the lock, it is a little more complicated. Since this lock is only 600 feet in length, Toes must be split in a process known as a double lockage. 
when a 15 barge tow enters the lock, deckhands manually uncouple all the cables holding the barges together at the 600 foot point, leaving nine barges in the lock. The tow boat with the remaining six barges backs out of the lock. When going upstream, the nine barges are raised to the next pool level, then pulled out using a motorized winch. The winch starts them moving and momentum takes them the rest of the way. Tying a line to a traveling kevel on a rail keeps the barges from floating into the main channel. They are then tied to the lock wall above the gates. The water is lowered to the same level as the tow boat and six remaining barges. The tow enters the lock and is raised to the level at which the other half of its load is tied. After getting lined up, the barges are then coupled back together with the first half of the tow and the 15 barge tow may leave the lock. When going downstream, the process is reversed, except that the first set of nine barges is flushed out of the lock rather than pulled with a winch. A double lockage can take up to two hours, while a single lockage takes only about a half hour. Inland waterways are very important to our economy. Transportation on the river runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with closures on the upper Mississippi in the winter due to ice and maintenance. Even with these locks and dams, there are still obstacles that can hinder navigation on the Mississippi River today. Two of the main culprits are high water and low water. In the springtime, snow melts and spring rains increase the natural water flow into tributary rivers. These higher water levels create fast moving currents and outdrafts that can pull towboats into dangerous situations. At times, the river must be closed until floodwaters recede. During a flood, the gates of the dam are lifted allowing the river to follow its natural course. In the Great Flood of 1993, the flood crest at Lock and Dam 15 reached 22.63 feet, more than seven and a half feet above flood stage. This flood followed heavy rains over a large area throughout several weeks of the summer. It was unlike any flood in recorded U.S. history. By direction of Congress, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has tried to lessen the effects of major flooding by building levees, flood walls, and reservoirs on tributaries. High water remains a concern, but low water depths also affect navigation. To keep tows moving on the Mississippi, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers helps maintain the stairway of water to minimum depth and width by dredging the bottom as needed. Large floating dredges remove sand and silt deposits that impede navigation. A rotating cutter loosens the material and a high volume flow of water transfers it through pipes to a deposit site on shore. Working 24 hours a day, these large machines remove thousands of cubic feet of spoil from a single dredge site. This material is often used as fill by cities and towns. It can also build up man-made beaches, becoming a source of recreation for thousands to enjoy. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is the largest provider of water-based recreation in the nation. The Corps is split into districts and projects. We are part of the Rock Island District, Mississippi River Project, Recreation and Natural Resource Management Section which operates and maintains over 25 public recreation areas along 314 miles of river. With 55,000 acres of forested land, our project is the oldest and one of the largest continually managed forested resources in the nation. We take pride in protecting our diverse natural resources while providing safe recreational opportunities for everyone to enjoy. The waters of the Mississippi provide a recreational playground for boating, water skiing, fishing, or just hanging out. However, the river can be a dangerous place. Water safety is important to everyone working and playing on the river. For safe operation, 
boaters need to be aware of navigational dams, wing dams, and other possible obstructions. Many prefer to keep their feet on dry land. Millions of wildlife watchers, hikers, bikers, and campers from around the country and the world flock to the Mississippi for an outdoor experience. Bird watchers take advantage of the Mississippi River Flyway for migrating birds, which is listed as a globally important bird area. Wildlife watchers can spot beaver, muskrat, turtles, snakes, deer, butterflies and dragonflies along the river. In winter, thousands of American bald eagles gather along the river to feed on fish. Many congregate near the locks and dams where the turbulent water does not freeze. The River Project helps provide recreational experiences through its campgrounds and day-use facilities. Amenities offered at our campgrounds are electricity, water, playgrounds, showers, picnic shelters, and boat ramps. Not staying overnight? Day-use areas are perfect for fishing, picnicking, hiking, launching a boat, or wildlife watching. Smith's Island, located just upstream of the Quad Cities, features a wildlife observation deck, benches, interpretive signs, and a designated National Recreation Trail. A Greek philosopher once proclaimed, you cannot step into the same river twice. From beginning to end, the muddy waters of the Mississippi have flowed since the last ice age, forging new paths, washing away the past, and building a new future. The river provides a place to live, to work, and to play. We depend on the waters of this massive natural resource just as wildlife and plants do, and its continued health depends on our commitment to its future.